Christian apologists like Dinesh D'Souza and Donald A. Carson are known to credit their religion with the abolition of slavery, often citing examples such as William Wilberforce as part of their argument. However, in the previous video, we looked at how numerous Christians in history have also justified slavery and a belief in the inferiority of blacks in the name of their faith. This indisputably resolves the charge that Christianity ended slavery, because it certainly cannot be said that the religion was responsible for the triumph of abolitionism if there were just as many devout and fervent Christians arguing in support of slavery as those opposing it. That fact leaves apologists with only one line of defense, classifying anti-abolitionist Christians as false Christians. The criteria used in this assertion is never made quite clear, but it seems only reasonable to assume that the so-called word of God is taken into account. By turning to it, perhaps we can get a fair idea of which Christians had scripture on their side in the slavery debate. What does the Bible say about slavery? Amazingly, the Bible gives instructions on how to buy slaves, who to buy as slaves, and how to treat them. From Leviticus 25, 44-46, Your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you, and members of their clans born in your country, and they will become your property. You can will them to your children as inherited property and can make them slaves for life, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. How are slave owners to treat their fellow Israelite slaves? If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone, but if he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master gives him a wife, and she bears him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door of the doorpost, and pierce his ear with an awl. Then he will be his servant for life. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as men's servants do. Think about that last sentence again and the fact that many Christians believe it is a part of the perfect word of a loving and good God. If a man sells his daughter as a servant. No denouncement follows. Instead, there is something much worse, instructing that female slaves are never to be freed. God doesn't have a problem with you selling your daughter into slavery. He just doesn't want her to ever be set free. Some Christians allege that slaves in biblical days were treated very differently from those acquired through the African slave trade. There are Bible verses like Colossians 4.1 that instruct slave masters to provide their slaves with what is right and fair. No matter how nice you are to your slaves, it still doesn't excuse the immorality of owning people as property, but this fair treatment may not be so fair anyway. Exodus 21.20-21 gives instruction on how to beat your slaves. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished, but he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. You can thrash them within inches of their lives, but make sure you don't directly kill them. I can picture some believers objecting that these quotes are all from the Old Testament so far, and who cares about that? It was a different time then, and blah blah blah. Yes, a different time when your God once sanctioned slavery. Actually, though, the New Testament is not much better. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. The Bible is not concerned with liberating slaves. In fact, these verses tell slaves to keep their mouths shut and remain obedient, so that the gospel message can spread more easily without the threat of an uproar over things like freedom and equality. The case of the abolitionist is a very thin one from scripture. Galatians 3.28 is often thrown around, which reads, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. While this might seem to teach equality, a closer inspection reveals that it merely communicates the accepting nature of their religion. A Greek is just as much a Christian as a Jew, a slave is just as much a Christian as a free man. Basically, no person can be more of a believer in Christ than another based on race, gender, or class. It does not, however, advocate the abolition of slavery in any sense. 
Based on the evidence of scripture, Christian abolitionists are less true Christians than those who argued for the persistence of slavery. The Bible never openly condemns slavery or calls for its end, but instead includes quite a lot of provisions on how to conduct it. Whether it is asserted that Christians ended slavery or that biblical Christianity ended it, neither could be farther from the truth. Were there Christians who participated in abolishing slavery? Of course, but their entire group and religion can no more be given credit on that basis than women can for playing a role in abolitionism. People of all different creeds, genders, and races contributed to the end of slavery in America. No single group bears more responsibility than another. In the last video, we also saw how many Christians expressed strong anti-Semitism in the name of their faith. Are modern Christians right in considering those individuals to be fake Christians too? What does the New Testament say about the Jews? Paul minces no words in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14-16, where he speaks of the Jews as those who killed the Lord Jesus, says that they displease God, heap up their sins to the limit, and invite the wrath of God upon them. He attacks them again in Titus 1, 10-14. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially among the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. Paul has been considered a Jew by many Christians based on his own testimony in the epistles, but I find this opinion very lacking in evidence. Paul expresses strong distaste for the Jewish law in his writings, frequent criticisms of the Jewish people, and a very poor understanding of Judaism for someone supposedly educated under Gamaliel, who was a pious leader of the Sanhedrin. There is also 1 Corinthians 9.20, To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Why would someone who was already a Jew try to become like a Jew to win them over? This verse just seems to indicate to me that Paul was a people pleaser, a chameleon who changed his identity whenever it would suit his purposes. This is greatly reflected in the narrative of Acts 22 through 23. Aside from Paul, John 8:44 has Jesus teaching against the Jews too, telling a group of them, "You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him." When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In Matthew 23:31, Jesus accuses the Jews of being descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Matthew 27:25 portrays the Jews as even volunteering to accept responsibility for Christ's execution. Modern Christians love their heroes who freed the slaves and treated Jews with compassion, but they miss a great deal of the picture when they prefer to imagine that any other way of thinking was factually non-Christian. No one doubts that there were professing Christians who endorsed slavery and slandered the Jews, so the question becomes one of their sincerity of faith. It seems quite arrogant to pretend that one can know the depth of a person's convictions so well, even those that we have never met. This matters little, though, because according to the Bible, these opponents of abolitionism and Jews were not the aberration. As much as it may disturb and enrage modern Christians, the evidence of Scripture shows quite well that the abolitionists and Jewish sympathizers were the aberrations in faith. In the next and final installment of the series, we will look at how racists continue to find inspiration from the Bible even still today.